Welcome to our ninth podcast marking International Women's Day and the themes are a really important one. The theme for this year is Break the Bias and the co-hosts for, for this are myself, Altaf Hussain and go on Anissa. Me, Anissa Akhtar, PR and comms here at the college. And we are joined by some pretty brilliant women today. And Sarah Owen, our local MP, Hina Sharif and Andrea Page. We'll get them to introduce themselves as and when. But before I hand over to our wonderful guests, it's probably a good idea to give some context as perhaps it couldn't come at a better time. Uh, we've got lots of stuff going on. I'm not going to go in, into that, but there's a huge amount of anger, lots of unrest caused by factions who simply are reluctant to listen to other people's views. And in too many countries, sadly, even now, women are still excluded from major decision making. That simply isn't good enough. You know, there is open bias against gender. It's not even closed or hidden. It's simply open and we need to do something about it. At Luton Sixth Form College, we have over 3,000 young people. Uh, over half of them are female um, and they make a huge difference to our, our college community. We believe that we can forge women's equality because if we demonstrate the power and value of more diverse opinions and experiences, we believe it leads to more powerful decision making. So we generally believe that together we can break the bias. But before we can break something, we need to know what it is that we're trying to break. So Anissa, what what do we mean by by bias? So some examples of biases which I've come across or have read can be a man never accepting a female boss the woman or accusing a woman of being over emotional when they when they're being assertive just because they want to cut them down or undervaluing an individual because of their age. Um, biases we come across we have unconscious biases we all do we all come with them every single human has one. Um, we all have stereotypes and this impacts the decisions we make in day to day life. Um, but if we're aware of these biases and why we have them, this will then benefit us happy, having a more open mind and including a more diverse world that benefits everyone, I think. So we need to know and accept that there is a challenge, yes. really. And then we need to have to be open and transparent about that before we can start making a difference. And as I said, we've got 3,200 young minds uh, and this is where what we do, we influence and we kind of influence that mind and that mindset. So, Sarah, you know, sort of as as a positive role model and thank you for all the work that you do. Generally, I've got no idea. I've got on social media asking you what you have for breakfast. You mm. haven't responded to my uh, question, by the way. Uh, <laughs> where you get the energy, I've got no idea, but you do a brilliant job. Over to you, Sarah, in terms of the theme and your thoughts. Thank you. I think I responded to not my breakfast, but what I eat during the day. And I can tell you it's a lot. Um, you have to be properly fueled, I think, if you want to be able to um, do the job. But also, I think, tackle some of the biases that we talked about head on. And I don't just mean fueled in terms of food, but I think you have to be fully supported and have a good network around you um, of not just strong women, um, and inspirational women, but also really good allies as well. Um, and that's something that I might talk about a bit later on when it comes to how we break those biases. Um, but I faced it um, as a a young, relatively young, um, it's all relative, um, woman in politics, mixed race from a working class background. That is not what you have typically within politics. I think it has changed considerably, but it's certainly not changed anywhere near fast enough. And I think what we then see is a skewed kind of world politics. And we saw that particularly with the pandemic um, on the front line was essentially a, a women heavy workforce. It was care workers, it was um, nurses, it was paramedics, it was women. And yet they were excluded really from the decision making processes. And we saw how badly that went wrong, which is why I think it's so important that we have more women, more diversity within our decision-making um, bodies, and as you said, out of, around the around the decision-making tables as well. Thank you, Sarah. And you mentioned just you mentioned about having great allies. Um, 
is that something you want to touch on now? That's really because it's all about the team that surrounds you, isn't it, really? And how have you got round to having those great allies? Is that through great communication skills or networking? How have you got those people? You can spot an ally a mile off. Um, <laughs> he might not. They might not know necessarily what to do or what's the best thing to do. But I would always say to somebody who wants to be an ally, ask the person. So I've been in meetings in a previous um, job within the trade union movement. It was it was very much um, a male dominated environment, particularly when you were talking with manufacturing or the energy sectors. And it was my job was political kind of strategy around any of the campaigns and I remember one particular meeting um, they asked me in they wanted my opinion about a campaign how we were going to tackle the political strategy on this and then when I opened my mouth they proceeded to talk over me and I thought well do you know what most of the time I don't have a problem having my voice heard and I will fight for it but actually on this occasion they're harming themselves because they asked for my expertise they asked for my position and I knew I had an ally in the room and so I just stepped back and I thought this is th to use a teacher phrase this is your time you're wasting <laughs> um, and I um, I thought that's my power and an ally in the room he looked at me afterwards he said I felt deeply uncomfortable with that meeting he said what do you think he said I want to I want to confront the man that did this because I don't think he necessarily even noticed he did it mm. and um, he did that and I also raised it as well with the, with the man afterwards and just said, like, if you ask me and ask for my time, for my opinion and my advice, you should listen to it. And it turned out he felt he was just really overexcited about the campaign. But he didn't do that to any of the men. Mm -hmm. And I think it was really important that not only was it picked up and I felt supported by an ally in the room, but it also forced the man to self-reflect and he did change. And that's ultimately the, get, the, the aim here is for change. It's not to shame anybody. It's not to, it's not to um, make anybody feel bad about mm. it, about their bias. I think it's about giving people the opportunity to self-reflect, to learn and to change. Yeah, and I think it kind of, I can always feel, you know, education always eats ignorance for dinner, really. But I think you've got to have the appetite in the first place. And it sounds like you educated, but you had to have the skills and the confidence to, because that's a tough conversation, isn't it, potentially, to have with someone uh, to say that you made me feel X, Y, Z. So, OK, so it feels like sometimes simply just talk to the person from what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. Sometimes talk to the person, but be aware that it may just never, Yeah. it might, it might not go right. It may not go well. Um, and, you know, I've, I've confronted somebody in the last three or four months and two of them, one of them, it went well. And they, they reflected and they said, actually, you know, I could have handled that a lot better. Um, and the other one, I just really didn't handle it well. Um, their apology, they asked me um, while in Parliament, they said, who do you work for in a room full of um, male MPs? And their apology then confirmed the bias, which was, you're a lot younger than I thought you would be. And I responded with, thank you very much for reaching out. I really appreciate it, your apology. But there are a lot of younger women MPs in Parliament now. And this sort of thing just isn't appropriate. And rather than taking that on board, he was offended that I didn't just take his apology. And so I think we have to be aware that when we are challenging bias, it may not always end in the result that you would want or you would hope for, um, which is why I think allies are really important whenever we're breaking those biases. Sarah, thank you. Hina, you've been listening very patiently to this. Any thoughts what you've heard or your own views and your own experiences, Hina? Um, I personally faced cultural biases when I wanted to um, continue with sports in education and further um, when I wanted to play um, alongside a team. So mm -hmm. the kind of biases I faced was in within the South Asian culture because sports wasn't deemed as a secure career. If you compare it to someone becoming an accountant, a lawyer, a doctor, etc. So like Sarah said be, having an ally is so important and the only reason why I was able to continue 
to study sports in college was because my secondary school teacher was my ally. So she helped me to convince my parents um, that there is secure careers when wanting to go into sports and you can make it sustainable in the future. Um, but I do think you have to be willing to have those open discussions and uncomfortable discussions with people that either you love or you care about and in order to make a change. So when Sarah spoke about allyship, I completely agree. I think you need men, women, anyone that can support you um, and provide a safe space. Um, but the cultural um, biases was what I faced when um, going into sports. And what does, because we talked about gender bias, but it's no, never one thing, is it? And you brought in cultural bias as well. So there's people listening. What does cultural bias mean? to you and then on top of that you bring in gender so but start off with cultural i'm really interested in your thoughts here yes yeah, so within the south asian community so i'm pakistani so one of the struggles that i dealt with was external individuals getting involved um within in immediate family discussions i'll tell you smiling i think you know what i'm on about it's the wide um, auntie yeah the <laughs> aunties that aren't even aunties were getting involved um so when i was sitting down to choose what i wanted to continue to study in sixth form a lot of aunties came and got involved and said to my mum if she studies cricket if she studies sports for instance she'll become a cricketer whereas my passion is researching and publishing research and you know increasing in the women and girls development and sorting that out um but it was the cultural barriers that I mean is I think it was culture slash religion clash because a lot of people just thought if I study sports I'll become a cricketer if I study sports I'll be in my shorts playing football but that wasn't the case so I was blessed because I had a really good connection with my family so I was able to have those uncomfortable discussions with them and actually challenge their way of thinking whilst challenging myself and the way I speak to them and how I communicate with them so it was not only personal growth but it was a growth as a family as well but it having my secondary school teacher helping me out really helped me um, to develop into college and then or further on to uni and now I'm doing my master's which is sociology and ethics of sports and if that if the cultural barriers didn't exist I'm currently researching how South Asian culture affects women's participation in sports and because I faced this problem, I wouldn't have been able to publish or work towards publishing my research. So for me, the way I navigate my mind and my thinking is those negative situations, I can turn it into a positive um, outcome. And you, it's about four or five years ago that you would have had that difficult conversation, let's be honest, with family members, etc. Do you think things are improving? Or Definitely. Yeah, I think um, not only within my family, but outside as well. So I currently work with um, grassroots development as well. And a lot more South Asian females are now, and aunties and uh, uncles and parents are now open for their daughter to participate. But I think what it comes down to is the facilities that are provided for those individuals to take part. So for instance, if there was a hijabi, um, there's a, the likelihood of them, uh, the parents' willingness to for them to be able to participate in football, for instance, the facility needs to be um, closed room. But I think organisations now are now more open into learning um, and providing those facilities in order to increase participation. So I think it works both ways within individuals and organisations as well. Organisations need to be able to listen in order for that change to happen. And how has that happened? Is that because of education? Is that because of investment? Is uh, I'm just interested. How do you think it's happened? Um, I think it's happened firstly by having uncomfortable discussions and not many people were aware of the barriers that females face. I know it sounds really silly, but a lot of individuals that I spoke to, they just thought females didn't want to participate because they didn't want their makeup to get ruined. And it was just comments like that, which really made me frustrated uh, because I wear makeup, but I couldn't care if my mascara was running as long as I'm doing something that I enjoy. So having conversations and opening up that discussion, but open it in a way where you're willing to engage with them and not attack them. I think for me, that's what that's where I found that the education um, aspect 
um, occurred, but it's kind of educating yourself as well on what they think um, the barriers are, what's speaking to them about what the barriers actually are. Okay, okay. Because I think it's, I'm, I'm listening because it sounds like a squiggly line to get to where you've got to, because not only have you got the cultural bias, the gender bias, you know, the, 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 Sarah mentioned about the working class, you've got the socioeconomic bias, and there's so many kind of layers that we have got. And Nisa, I know you had is it an unconventional route to, to your master's degree. Yeah. Does this resonate with Completely. you? Completely. So when, Hina, you're talking about the aunties getting involved or the the, the the not so traditional routes completely relate to it and like you I was very similar where I had a great family unit at home mm. where my A-levels were random like it's bizarre I don't know how who signed me up for them it was R English psychology it was RS it was just a random mix um art being the, the bit of outlier I was like what are you going to do with art where's that going to get you but still did it because my dad was like no just what let her do what she wants and then university did that my master's then random philosophy I mean I am yet to come across a Pakistani girl from Luton who has a passion for philosophy and I think that threw some people off because even at the time it was like you're wasting a year of your life you're going to waste so much for what um and I, and I you speak you speak about there's being a shift and I and I, and I like to think there's a shift but I still think there's so much to do I mean the shift has been made, but it's so small in comparison to where I think we need to be mm. with biases like gender, so, social, mm. cultural. Mm. There's so much more work to do, I think. But education yeah. seems to be a, a key kind Absolutely. of component of it. So, yeah. so Andrea, you know, coming from the the uh, from, from education, etc. Thoughts? You've you've been listening on scan very patiently. What are your views? I, I just pick up picked up on Sarah's point about allies because that was something I'd made a note of because um, one of the you know the, I'm a little bit older than the other two ladies in the room and the sort of the, the gender bias that I experience working in industry and, and not in education I have to say I think it's a completely different world but in industry during the 80s um, was not great and it was particularly bad when when um, I had my children uh, I remember one particular performance review meeting and I'd gone back to work. And my, I was the only woman that had gone back at that level in the organisation after having a family or having a child. Um, and it was unprecedented. And my line manager said to me, well, people say about you that you only work to pay the mortgage. So, OK, and then went on to say, but that's OK. It would be worse if they thought you didn't like your children. <laughs> and it just... You cannot imagine somebody being able to say that now. So that really pleases me. But in that environment, the worst judges were other women, I think. And I think that's something that still I had a conversation at a dinner party on Friday, which was along similar lines. And I do think that until women are their own best allies, then all of those gender biases will will not will not be completely broken. And why do you think that it's sorry to interrupt, like why is it that women on women can't can't actually forge a side because I think I I pick up on a lot of what you said about nothing's going to happen until women are on one side and sometimes mm. the worst enemy is not a man in the room no and and I think it's sometimes because we all have our own lacks of confidence areas where we lack confidence we all have our own insecurities and sometimes it's easier to defend those by judging other people and I think <laughs> What we need to do is accept that all of us have different choices in life. We all follow different routes and all of those are, are valid. And, you know, we need to be supporting each other in that rather, rather than judging. And it's something that, you know, I was when I came into education, I became a tutor, a personal tutor, working with young women in my tutor groups, helping them to um, form their choices for university. And, and, and also even interviewing, as we talked about earlier, the year 11 interviewing that we're doing at the moment, helping young women to, to think about where they want to go has been really brilliant. And I've really enjoyed that. And what I'm really seeing now, and, and that's, so that's sort of 20, 20 years doing that, the, the number of women now who are coming and talking about, I would like to go into engineering, or I'd like to do sport, or I'd like to do IT. And, and you know, it's those those stereotypes are slowly but surely being eroded, and and that's that's brilliant. But there's a lot to do. Still a lot to do. And do you believe 
it's, it's, it is encouraging. It sounds like there is improvement. But do you believe there's enough women at the top table, wherever that top table is, or in that position of influence or, or, or not? Or, well, just before Sarah arrived, we were joking, weren't we? We, about the, the, we have a director of curriculum, we have a director of finance, director of HR, um, a lot of um, strong women leadership in the college. But that's not reflected in industry. I think education is very different. And, you know, there are physical reasons why women have to take career breaks, shorter ones or longer ones, depending on their own personal choice. And that does have an impact, without a doubt. And I still think that despite all of the um, steps forward that society has taken, that women do tend to take a greater role in the responsibility for childcare. I've, I've always had a brilliant husband who's who's shared everything equally with me but there's still a perception that it's your responsibility slightly more than it is the male responsibility and I think that that has a big impact so therefore that takes a little bit of your focus away from your career um, so you're not 100% focused in the same way that men might be and that that brings its own glass ceiling if you like so I don't think it's, there's a quality around the boardroom um, not just for ways that that, um, that women are judged, but also just in terms of society and how it operates now, childcare support is there. And until all of that infrastructure is behind women in the right way, there will never be a completely equal fit playing field. And that's something that, that really needs to be changed and addressed. And is that, and I don't want to be talking just about the college, but the reason why we have such important people, females in the key positions is, because we look at our policies and our procedures, flexible working, we see that as a strength and actually we respond yeah. accordingly. And like not just for women either, Alta, and yeah, that, yeah. that's really important. I, you know, the mums and dads, the men and women, women yeah, yeah. who are carers, men who are carers for elderly parents, we treat everyone with that compassion and that flexibility, and that's important. Otherwise, you start to get a whole new set of gender biases and or, or biases against people in different situations, parents, non-parents, et cetera. But it is, it's that, it's that attitude and that flexibility makes a big difference. And they always say, because I'm just going to bring you tools and ends in terms of if someone was listening to this in a position of power, wherever that phrase is, et cetera, and they could take one takeaway from this, what would it be? But I always feel that culture takes a while to change, but you can change habits much mm. quicker, you know, and that mm. can be done. Uh, and But people give up because they want cultures too big. There are ways that we can improve things and change things. So... Sarah, uh, any takeaway plus anything else you want to throw in to, to, to the mix? I think um, absolutely what Hina and Andrea and Anissa had said um, about the different barriers that women face. We don't just face a barrier because we're a woman. There are lots of different barriers on top of that, whether it's a woman of colour, whether it's a woman of a certain age, whether you're older or younger, um, with your working class, with your disabled, all of those are additional biases and barriers that you have to overcome or people have to get past before you even get a hearing. So I would say that the biggest takeaway is, is that whenever you see a woman or you hear a woman speaking, particularly in a traditionally male environment, my goodness, they have broken so many barriers just to be in that room. So really challenge your own bias when you are listening to them. Don't say exactly what they've said after them and nick their idea and get credit for it. Say it was their idea and my goodness, that was fantastic. And I think really give ourselves credit as well for being that change, for breaking those barriers and for getting that bias thrown back in our faces sometimes. And it can be tiring. It can be really tiring. I would love one day for women to be able to walk into a room and for their voice and their words to matter and to mean as much as the bloke next to them. And that's what I want to be able to see so that we don't have to think, how am I going to cope with this bias? How am I going to have to fight to get my voice heard and my ideas put forward and own my ideas? Um, and I think that that is really what we should all be striving. But that's a two way street for the mm. people within the room and for the people going into it as well. Thank you, Sarah. Hina, any takeaways, anything else you want to throw in before we close up? Um, I was just going to say in order for it to change, it needs to be a collective thing. Um, so I think for me personally, it's really important to challenge yourself 
and be willing to educate and learn. So I think it needs to change and it can only change with allies and females recognizing the strengths that they have and that they deserve to be in that room and that they have the same ability that the man has in that room. So I think recognizing your strengths and never ever um, stopping yourself to educate and improve yourself as well. It's really interesting because I think when I mentor aspiring leaders and I'll mentor the guys and they will look at a job and they will look at all the things that they can do and they'll ignore all the things that they can't do. Whereas I'll mentor my female aspiring leader and there'll be one thing out of 99 that they can't do and that's what they've, uh, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, you've given up already. So it, it is, I think, it starts from yourself. Also, it needs to be coached and supported in terms of actually giving people the confidence to realise that they are better than they actually think they are. Mm. Thank you. And Andrea? I'm just very encouraged because of the three young women in the room with me. And I think these examples are what are going to break the bias because, yes, it is about other people's attitudes. I do agree. But it's about we, what we do. And it's what the examples we set to the women that are coming after us and the other women that work with us as well. And that's what will really make a difference. OK, and as I said, I think it's very much about diverse opinions, experience, morally it's the right thing to do. And that is actually simple good business mm. as well, you know, to actually <laughs> get, get that because, you know, as powerful decision makers. Uh, and Nisa, anything else you want to throw into the mix? Not really, just call it out when you see it. Enough of being quiet now. I think women for so long have just sat there and listened to men tell them what to do. And I think as I get older and learn more about myself, it's more a case of no, to have, like you all have said, have those uncomfortable conversations and call it when you see it. Um, why well, not? <laughs> yeah, I've never had that luxury, but OK, fine. Uh, but but no, I think you're right. I think seriously, yeah. in my view, if you don't condemn, you condemn, yeah. you know, sort of. I honestly believe that. So, you know, and staying quiet uh, it just gives mm. the impression to other people that you agree with that point of view. So but there are ways to condemn. It can be done respectfully with the oh, right level of communication. Not saying how to kick off. Oh, no, no, I can say that, <laughs> actually. But maybe sometimes people aren't told how to kind of have a difficult conversation yeah. and how to say to a man look when you said this this is how it made me feel and then they avoid so it can be taught it isn't a natural thing so I think there are encouraging signs you know I think there is movement etc really really encourage just listening to to you four um and as I said it's all about being together all of us working together to, to break that bias so ladies thank you really appreciate your time um, I'm humbled and inspired and slightly scared in, in equal measures really just listening to you folks rightly so powerful women who've got an opinion and I hope that people listening to us have actually kind of taken something away. So thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it.